Okay, so recording should be working. Welcome everybody. Um, this is the second set. What? <laughs> it's a moment. Apparently, the recording doesn't want to. No. It's a moment. Let me just share this. Let's again. It seems to me that the recording is on, but I don't know. Uh, you mean it's not being recorded? No, no, it seems to be fine. Um, I'm for some reason I didn't get the uh, to work. Uh, now it's working. So, welcome everybody to the second core session. I am Jaime Jimenez, and uh, to, together is, uh, with Marco Tiloca, we are the chairs of the working group. Um, today, the session, uh, we assume, as always, that people have been reading the drafts and are aware of the latest and greatest in the working group. Um, we also, um, well, as you know, we are having this remote participation, and we will be using uh, well, sorry, first the IPR. So uh, the, the the note well applies to this core session, and and well, you should be aware of the note well that is defined in RFC 8179. Uh, it also contains some guidelines uh, that kind of uh, tell us uh, a bit on the behavior. So let's try to be nice as well, and all the IPR considerations. So. Um, so, uh, yeah, another point is that we will have the remote session. So, as, as you know, there is the uh, Jabber where you can ask for queuing. We are not that many people, so it might be that you can just, you know, politely just jump in, especially um, later on as we have a discussion. It will depend. So, let's see how it goes on the discussion session. Um, I, I assume you all know how to use the uh, queue boat that we have in the Jabber. If not, you can use also the WebEx. So the Thursday session has a bit on, uh, you can see there, the, the topics, and we will have a bit on uh, discovery topics and on, on uh, some new drafts on uh, link, uh, uh, a new link relation or implementation information, and then some resource directory uh, updates. Then we will have a coral and uh, in general core applications discussion there at, at 145 we will have uh, that that's an, a new thing that we are trying out <laughs> which is more having a bit more debate in the in the in the group uh, for for technical decision making and then finally we will have uh, the sentiment cluster so i think i didn't forget anything so without further ado let's start, um, in order not to waste time let's just start uh, i think it was 101 You're in. Good afternoon or good morning. Um, so um, the, the agenda has been shuffled around a little bit, uh, so I, I wasn't exactly expecting to do this one first, but uh, we can do that. Um, so a while ago in the Think to Think research group, uh, we had been discussing the the situation that right now it, it's really hard to find diagnostic information uh, for for implementations that are out there. Um, and uh, I wrote a draft, and and people seem to generally like it, but uh, we we weren't quite sure whether whether there's enough uh, energy here that that we actually should be uh, pushing this forward. And it seems to me that we actually uh, have this energy now. Next slide. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the observation is in the HTTP world, we have uh, things like server and, and user agent that are essentially sent with every request and every response, actually the other way around. Um, so y you always know what, what kind of implementation you are talking to at the other end. In the core, in the core, world, that would be not not generally a, an acceptable strategy. Um, so uh, we are not currently providing any information 
uh, right now. And the idea is that uh, since we already have uh, uh, the discovery mechanism, we might use it here as well. So we might want to make the information that would normally be in the, the server header field in, in HTTP uh, available through discovery. And well-known core is kind of the natural uh, place for that. Now, we wouldn't usually want to put the actual information there. Uh, but would provide a link like, like all the other resources that are described in a uh, well-known call. And uh, if that is the case, then we probably need an appropriate link relation uh, type. And uh, th there are lots of link relation types uh, out there. Next slide, please. Um, but uh, there's not really one that fits this specific application. Defining link relation types should be a relatively lightweight uh, thing to do. So I, I just went ahead and, and wrote a couple of paragraphs for a link relation type I, I called impl info. Well, it could have been implementation information, but then we would always waste that space in well known call. So I called it impl info. And that is meant for links that point to implementation information. Uh, now, the draft does not currently propose to define media types for what this could point to. Um, we could do that later. Uh, so we can start using this uh, before we have these media types defined, which might be a bigger uh, effort. Or we could actually think, uh, well, for instance, HTML is a great media type for having uh, descriptions of, of implementation information. Uh, uh, out there. Uh, so uh, again, the proposal is not to define these media types now. Um, there's of course also a concern that adding more to well-known core might uh, uh, help those people who are using well-known core for, for DDoS. So there is a little bit of text in there that, that discusses uh, that point and reinforces that you really should be using the mitigation uh, that is uh, defined in IRC uh, 7252. Next slide. Um, so the, the previous slide should be the end of my presentation, but um, one interesting point that came up is that there is an activity going on uh, defining something called security.txt, and it's highly controversial because uh, Clearly, this this can be used in a stupid way, and it also can be abused in interesting uh, ways. But on the other hand, it also has upside. So uh, th there are people proposing going forward with this uh, uh, document. And as far as I remember, it's an ISG last call right now. Not sure. Um, have, haven't checked this week. Um, so uh, we might want to do something like security.txt uh, for, for this space, because security.txt itself is, is not the right thing. It's, it's meant for websites. Uh, it, it's meant for pet websites, so websites that, that are maintained by people and, and uh, where, where people are looking at and so on. Um, and um, so, what we are doing here is more like a kettle uh, uh, kind of thing. Um, anyway, so uh, th th there, there are various uh, kinds of information that would go into such a security.txt, uh, and uh, we would have to find a way to merge that information or to point to multiple uh, sources and so on. So I'm, I, again, I'm proposing not to tackle this at the moment, but of course uh, we should discuss this. So please discuss. Yep, and I see in the queue already Michael, so go ahead, please. Um, I think this is a great idea, Karsten. Um, I mostly agree with your comments about security text. Maybe the, the format that security text has proposed is something to consider other than for HTML. I'm concerned about HTML because I don't think we really want to have Someone embed JavaScript and stuff into it, and so I'm concerned about that. Um, so if you were going to pick something, then I would say you should pick Cbor JSON, 
or but uh, the other thing that you might we might want to consider or this document might want to provide as a separate um, tag is to have a, a MUD RFC 8520 URL, which often will tell you lots about the implementation as well. All right, that's interesting. Um, Christian, you're in the queue as well. Um, yeah, so I, I, I really think we should we should have this in there and I don't think that pinning down any of the content of the media types doesn't really matter because this is something that can be changed after this is rolled out and one reason I think we should what I think we should have one reason why I think we should have this is that if um, if co-op is abused to do things like amplification because implementations get things wrong um, this can easily reflect badly on the protocol as such. And if we get more implementations to ship implementation info, at least about their libraries or about their product, um, this can be used to find to actually find the offending implementations and make sure that they have upgrade plans on mitigation in place. And, and Christian, you're referring to the link to this link relation, not to the security.txt, right? I'm referring to this link relation, yes. Um, I'm unfamiliar with the details of security TXT, so I can't really comment on that. But from a very high level point of view, it looks like something that would be an, a discussion behind it around which which content formed and which information should be there. But the device itself can't shouldn't probably have any more information than I am this, and for any inform implementation information, just see there. Very good. And and, oh, sorry. The to be clear, um, implementation information here would be if, if I run a lib co-op server somewhere, then it would point to the lib co-op homepage. So uh, it doesn't seem to help if I want to know who's, uh, whose fault it is for the amplification attack, because it's not the lib co-op developers, right? Um, it's probably it's probably the it's at least the documentation of libcoop. So it's it 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 might be something that's built upon it that is not declared, but it's at least it's some information. And I expect regular applications that are built on libraries to override their libraries default of I'm something based on libcoop to I'm this particular application. Klaus, do you, I mean, just because you are discussing, do you have anything else on that or? Um, no, it's an interesting topic, sounds uh, useful to have. And uh, I, I think there are lots of interesting questions around this. So having some discussions is useful. Okay. Then going back to the queue. Um, so uh, my on the, one question I have for Karsten on the security TXT, other than the hiring information that maybe is not so relevant, uh, is at the end of the day, it's just a list of emails of of who are the uh, security response, the, the, those responsible for the security of, in the case of IoT, that particular IoT device. So uh, you mentioned at some point uh, that it will depend a lot. It will depend a lot on the deployment use case, and who is. Uh, I mean, what, what, how do you envision this? Is it uh, something that the uh, management uh, company of the devices or the manufacturer of the device has to provide or uh, how, how is it done? Because that will change everything. And uh, also considering MUDs, that's also done during the, uh, is something that is supposed to be at the factory. So um, the deployment uh, scenarios matter for the security.txt. And then to the link relation, I, I also agree with Christian yeah, in, in general. So well, with you and Christian, so. Okay, so the, this really was about implementation information, not about deployment uh, information. But I mean, I mean, mean, mean for the security.txt, uh, it will have information about those responsible for the security of the of the specific endpoint. If they, if if somebody finds a vulnerability, so who are those? I mean, wouldn't it make a difference if it is those owning the device or deploying the device, or because it could be different companies? Yes. So I, I would like to separate implementation information, which, which might give you a pointer for who wrote the code, from deployment information, which gives you an information might give you information on uh, who forgot to to uh, 
properly configure the firewall or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, right now, I'm not sure that we will get very far with deployment information. And we can think about that, but uh, typically people who commission devices uh, will not be very successful in, in putting deployment information in there. Well, maybe we can invent something for that. But I, w I was hoping that this uh, really is something that can be set at the factory, like MUD uh, can be. Uh, and, and I have a question for Michael, who's next in the queue. Uh, so what is the relationship between this and MUD? Would, would I have a I, I already have some mud stuff going on uh, in 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 the uh, DHCP or whatever uh, the device uses to gain access to the network. Now, how is the 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 mud information? How would you expect somebody who's out there in the, in the internet to use that uh, mud information? And and what is the the chain of of uh, accesses that would lead uh, that that someone to that. Michael. Um, yeah. So. Um, um, so it the, the 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 mud URL, even if you couldn't retrieve it at all, um, would essentially allow you to fingerprint the device and therefore know, um, and probably by examining the URL, you would know who built it. Um, it much more interesting than I think that it contains lib co-app. Um, I just, I wanted to, I got in the queue because I wanted to say I would strongly want to discourage lib co-app from answering this by default with any, with saying lib co-app version. Um, because I think I really, really, really think we want to have something about who uses it, not who, not which library it is, but I could be persuaded otherwise. Um, I think Carson that, so you could put the mud URL in uh, in DHCP, yeah, uh, which doesn't work at all when you have IPv6 RA uh, only, so you're never going to get that information. So that's an interesting place where something could come and ask the device, a mud controller could ask the device, well, who are you uh, there? Um, and uh, we can have implementation information, and we've talked about having coswids in the mud file. Um, and we could have a lot of detail and it doesn't have to be in the device necessarily just by reference. Does that answer your question? Not sure. Yes, I, I was just thinking about what, what expectations we are creating here. So um, given that, that a MUD file really is a declaration from a device to, to its surrounding network environment, uh, it may not accurately describe how that device actually looks like uh, on the outside. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that, that the MUD URL is always very useful for, for someone uh, who's trying to find out what's going on with, with the web implementation over there in the network. Um, guys, well, um, I think with Michael, before, point. because... Yeah. Just a second. Um, this is very interesting, but we really have a tight schedule. And I think Marco just mentioned that we are several minutes behind. So if that's okay, let's put a pin on this. Um, I think the presentation was nice. I don't think we are asking for adoption or anything like that at the moment, right, Karsten? Or, or are you actually? Well, uh, actually, I think if, if we have agreement that we don't have to do the media type uh, right now, uh, then I think I, I would ask for, for adoption. Okay, yes. um, very good. Um, I would say uh, on the, okay, I see that uh, at least there is two people in the Jabber that would be in favor of that. I would suggest let's take it to the mailing list. Let's not do it right now. Okay. And if we have sufficient people on the on yes. the mailing list that are positive and discussion uh, also goes on there, we will, we will uh, consider the adoption. All right? Good. Thank you. So let's move to Christian. I'm sorry for the... Delay, by the way, um, can anybody see anything? I don't know why the presentation is so small. <laughs> Sorry. You might want to zoom in a bit. Um, the thing is that, uh, I don't know if I can actually, let me check. Is it better now? Yes. All right, great. Go ahead. Okay. 
So I'll, I'll try to make this quick. Um, this is not really a document presentation. Because it touches on a document that Carsten has written some time ago, um, but it's really more about a topic that I'd like to warm up the discussion about that how, how we as a working group want to go forward with this. Uh, the main theme is unsolicited responses. That is, you send a you some something happened some time ago and then the server decides to send a client a response where the client probably knows from some context or something in the message that what it's a response to even though it didn't explicitly request it um now the there is precedent uh, next slide please there's some precedent for this already in the core protocol i mean um observation does this on a, on a very fundamental level um, multicast responses are a bit related because they don't arrive from the original address but there have been th this has come up all, uh, over and over again in in different applications so um the the uh, cast uh, draft mentions triangle setups where request is sent but the response the device expects the response over a different transport. Something like this was also in co-op over SMS. Um, some time ago, there was talk about blocks to transfer with larger window sizes. Um, Dots recently requested something similar, and it could be used for cache pre-population pre just as well. And last but not least, the multicast notifications I talked about last time. Um, they do something. They do something very similar. They say. Um, sub, um, so suppose you sent that request and now you're getting the responses to this. The, the crux of the thing is always the tokens. So in for observations, um, it's very it works there because there was a prior request and some of those cases could probably profit from from a similar setup um, where we say that okay it because there is this and that condition, there can be multiple response on that token. Um, some suggestions are also out there about out of message layer, as of, about some agreement between client and um, client and server about what tokens could be used. So, like a request sending a lease with it. So, and by the way, please for further responses use tokens from two. And of course, you can also, and that's what the the core responses draft does is. Um, <clears throat> introduce options that change the rules about um, tokens. So for example, let's say the token doesn't matter. I'm just a response and this is what it's about. Um, I think we should continue this work in some way and not just leave it to all the messages. Um, yeah, the, the um, responding to, to the question from Jabber, uh, what requests I envision here? Yes, I envision primarily get and fetch requests. So um, it could probably, um, yeah, it, it, it could probably it could probably work with with other types as well. But then it's re it then those on an application level still need to be side effect free because it's usually an suppose you sent a post request with this and that payload, then I would now be responding with uh, that payload. So that's a bit fuzzier. So I think it makes sense to primarily think about get and fetch requests in the first place. Uh, what do you think? Should we, should we keep, should we, what, what, what should we do about this? I mean, what is the, uh, the document is currently expired, right? Expired. Yes. By, so... by a year or more. So, Carson, what is the plan? Oh, sorry. The document actually opens up a number of alternatives. And I think uh, Christian has uh, pointed out that, that uh, there is one alternative that actually might be low-hanging fruit here. Uh, and um, I agree that, that th this is probably an approach that could be used. I think the hard part here will not be defining um, the, the, the actual protocol, but defining the the context and the usage that we actually envision uh, for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we need some some more discussion there, but I, I would be happy to, to pick up that discussion again and uh, to create a more targeted uh, document uh, specifically on this one alternative. And um, on the DOTS case, uh, is this coming also from someone from DOTS, by the way? I'm not aware of this. 
Um, yeah, we had um, there was a mail bit, um, a mail on the dots and core mailing list recently about we are observing a block one and we want oh, yeah. to get a block two uh, uh, a first block and we want to get follow up blocks through again uh, through just as well because our back channel might be clogged so we just want to send out everything and and hope for the best and then they can still selectively get missing parts. I mean, let, let's see. Um, I guess. Oh yes. Sorry, Jaren. Go ahead. Just a question. Uh, Carsten mentioned one option here. How does this relate to what's discussed in the multicast notifications? Is it would it use the same same idea as as there, or would would this be a separate draft that is referenced by the multicast notification? How do how do they? What is the proposal? Yeah, that, that's good good part of the discussion. So the, the multicast notification relies on, on actually uh, having a, a token defined for that. So it, it's a more efficient way of doing this, while this here is uh, something that, that's maybe more useful for out of the blue uh, uh, stuff. Um, and, and again, we, we should be discussing the contexts and the usages that we have in mind, and maybe at the end we find out that the multicast case actually is is the the one that is most useful, and we, we are not going to do the other uh, ones. On the the block two uh, thing, uh, yes, we designed block two to be slow, um, and uh, if we need something that that works under attack, uh, which is what the the uh, that's people need. We might want to craft something specifically for this use case. I'm not sure that this will will actually be of general use because there's probably a need to actually play loose and fast with the congestion control rules. I think that there's the congestion control rules, control rules. There's kind of three topics. There's congestion control rules. There is uh, token usage and there is message semantics. And I think all of them need to be tackled, but largely they would be orthogonal. So I, I sense we, we, we do have some energy here. So let's uh, continue this, the discussion on the list and try to come up with a scheme where, where the three things somehow fit in, not necessarily with the same solution. Thanks. Yeah, I agree. Let's uh, continue on the list and see what is the outcome of that one. Um, let's move on to the next topic, which is the RD. Yep, still me. Uh, so a brief update on resource directory status. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the Dash 24 um, has been published with all the things that we discussed in, in ITF 106. Um, most importantly of those is that now we have this very um, very minimal subset of RD, AD, and SSD interaction um, explicitly written out there. Uh, so this can so this the, so the RD can be discovered over DNSSD, um, and you've probably read the rest of the change log. Um, we've received um, two reviews in the in the ISG process already from uh, Sectier and Genart. Um, and I'll go in the next slides over the smaller to larger problems that will or that will need addressing in some um, way. Next slide, please. So the the simple stuff is already being processed and largely has pull requests on on GitHub. That will that that's easy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a bit harder is the topic of uh, DDoS mitigation. We'll we should probably say something in here again. Um, I, from my point of view, it should largely be sufficient to, um, yeah, um, yeah. <clears throat> it should largely be sufficient to refer to, uh, what is already prescribed by RFC 7252 and the updates in echo request tag that say that you, there is a recommended way of doing this amplification mitigation. Um, I'm not sure whether we should really say something explicitly about about what is coming up now, or whether we can just rely on whatever this uh, seven two five two is being updated to. 
related to that topic is um, something that came up basically when I processed the the, the input from uh, from Adam Montville. That is, a simple registrations probably have something uh, that we should take into consideration. That is, uh, a simple registration can be started from a from a unicast uh, from an address from a request with a fake address, and that would possibly leak information. Um, I could take questions now because Carsten's in the queue. I just wanted to point out that uh, uh, from a procedural point of view, so we don't create a dependency, it's uh, sufficient for us uh, to point to the DDoS mitigation text in 7252. And uh, Echo will add a second way, which actually mm -hmm. can be combined if you uh, really want to. Um, and uh, but, but we don't have to wait for that. Okay. Uh, so the mitigation in 7252 actually works even if it is a little bit inefficient. Okay. Thanks. Okay. And are, um, yeah. Were not some of the security considerations related to the authorization as well? Or was it only DDoS? Uh, yeah, next, uh, that would be next slide. Okay. Um, I'll, come, I'll come to that. Uh, no, but stay here, please, for a moment. So it's just. Sorry. And um, the last, prob probably easy, but we still have to get it right point is we have a section in there about endpoints picking their names randomly. Um, uh, Russ's point here was that, yeah, it should be sufficient that, if, that we have size here, but maybe it's not so, um, we, we, should can, we should get an impression of what what do we do we really need that and if we need it how do we get it right in the first place Kama? yeah so the endpoint name used as identifier for anything in practice because my understanding was that the, it was the security context that was used to identify the endpoint when it registers um from the resource directory's point of view it looks at the security context but Clients might that, but look, but clients that perform lookup might or might, may or may not, depending on the application, um, put some meaning to the endpoint names. And if they do, they hopefully do this on a on a resource directory that enforces any meaning in them. Um, this is for cases where no meaning is assigned there. And, and here, when you say guidance, might. Uh, on site might suffice, but what other options are there? Like so in in so. In Lightweight and Twem, uh, no, actually, forget Lightweight and Twem. Anyways, the, the point is that, uh, do you suggest that it is the RD somehow assigning some hash to the endpoint name and not no, allowing, because so, remember that we have this URN uh, draft on, that is basically the endpoint will use, potentially could use these URNs that it decides. So, I mean, like the, the endpoint name will be picked by the uh, device registering. Uh, Christian, uh, I don't hear you. Sorry, I was muted. Um, okay. Yeah, this is this is exactly um, this is exactly about the case where the client picks the random identifier, but the client will still need to know basically how long that random identifier needs to be in order to work. Mm. So, if 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 this thing with the URNs is coming up, um, that might be something we can put in there. And because your ends, we, because we know that your ends never collide, we won't will never run into trouble. Um, so that's exactly what I'm asking for here. Is it good enough if we just put something in there or do we want to think this through more thoroughly? And if the URNs is already something that is coming up from another side and that's being thought through there, then probably put a, put a random URN in there is, is good enough for here. Next slide, please. The harder part, and especially the part where I'm asking the working group for, for a bit more input, is the interaction with uh, endpoint names derived from, from certificate details. So there is this common name field, and we've um, only recently put a mo bit more text in there that says that how this can be used and what makes it unique. But turns out this wasn't all correct. So if someone is experienced in where the, all those fields in X509 certificates come from, 
and how they could be used. Um, it would really be helpful if we could sit down with someone and talk this through about what can actually be used to work from a certificate. Um, and not yet on the slides, but um, it came up kind of in parallel is the is the general question of what what do we want to prescribe in terms of security policies? So right now there's there are a few suggestions of what the security policies can look like, but there's no too concrete guidance. So um, my question that I'd like to add here is, do we want to do something in a separate document later on that describes how a security policy of an, of an RD could be managed, what it could look like, um, whether the, how, how this exactly relates to ACE, and do, we, and do we need to know anything about this now for this document? Uh, Carsten? Yeah, so um, I'm, I kind of didn't pay attention when, when this uh, entered uh, the, the discussion, and I think it's uh, completely misguided to, to uh, have anything in this document that talks about certificates at all. Um, and um, I think I'm also not particularly happy about doing a separate document later, but maybe there's a reason to, to do that. Um, I think the, the underlying problem here is that the, the resource directory actually is a protocol that can be used by a set of applications. And each of these applications have different authorization uh, requirements. Uh, and uh, it, it's not the purpose of this document uh, to, to define those applications. And, and so we, we are not going to, to get to a situation where we can say much about the authorization considerations. I mean, it's like as if uh, HTML, HTTP was, was uh, going to define how a, a web application actually runs its database with usernames in it uh, and so on. No, you don't do that. that that's the application that uh, defines that. So we should focus on, on the things where the protocol actually interacts uh, with uh, something. And I'm not even sure that we need to, to, to have uh, X509 uh, in there at all. So we have things like A's where, where we actually even can carry around X509 stuff if we, we want to. Um, but uh, resource directory should be free of, of this stuff. Personally, I'm happy to rip it out, but um, there were the questions, there, there were questions about the authorization model that we probably need, that we might need to add, still, still need to answer it but maybe differently in the sense that yeah, we just say, I, okay, I think this is up to the, this is really up to the application and we can't give yeah. evidence because. There, there are people who have the, the SNMP scars. Um, so SNMP v3 um, actually came with uh, various uh, authorization models uh, over time. And basically the, the idea was that uh, in a network, you would have a situation where where the the network, the network management, uh, would would somehow provide an overall authorization scheme, and any single agent would be able to to uh, plug into that. Uh, but I think that that's not at all the deployment uh, idea we have for for resource directories. Um, so just just like Co-op, which which interfaces to to a number of SDOs, very very different ways of, of doing uh, authorization and even authentication. Um, I think we should not tie a resource directory any any specific one of those. Okay, um, if I can just jump in, um, maybe to summarize the discussion. I guess uh, um, we have some opinions in the Jabber as well. Those have been reflected, reflected in the ethernet. I don't think we are trying to add uh, another 20 pages of uh, how to do ACE with resource directory in the resource directory document, right? Nobody's trying to do that, as far as I know. Um, so I, I guess maybe short paragraphs on guidance, because right now there is nothing on, on 
no, no pointers, I believe, to uh, how to do that, how to do authorization. So maybe like small text on on how like pointers to relevant documents, and perhaps later on down the road, because this has popped up in other areas and in other discussions, how to use RD and and ACE. Uh, together, it could be something that could be done in Team to Thing or in Elbic or elsewhere, right? If, if those who want to do it are, are still interested, but maybe not on this particular document, I believe. Um, Alexei, you, you commented on the chat, I would like to have because the, the main comments left are yours. So if you could just uh, manifest yourself and say uh, your current thoughts. So uh, Barry, who is expecting uh, some resolution to this. I really need yep. to uh, read the current text because I don't currently remember. Um, yeah, but uh, I, can, I can do it like within a couple of days or something. And from my part, I, I have nothing in particular. I'm just watching the discussion and waiting for it to resolve so very good so let's try to come up with uh, some text there i think we have a general agreement so mm -hmm. um i hope the minutes were taken somewhere uh, my my ethapad is not working very well so let's move on to the next one which is also related to rd so christian Yes, and this is all the things that should really not slow down resource directory because they can uh, next slide please um, so things things we can do in a resource directory, but we don't specify, next slide please, um, in the main document because we don't need to, uh, because we have extension points and next slide please. Um, and it might also be helpful here to explain how to build on resource directory in, in other documents. What I've written for this is, is a document that's really, next slide please, a mixed bag of things that could be um, could be tacked onto a resource directory. So one topic, uh, just run through them briefly. Um, one topic is reverse proxying. Um, a device wants to register the resource directory but doesn't even have a public address that it can properly use. So just asks the resource directory to make one up and put that in instead of the actual address. Uh, think, uh, think turn a bit. Um, especially for those cases, you might also want to have uh, in, infinite lifetimes because hey, you have a TCP connection open and as long as that's open, uh, the registration is good. Um, there's also a few points in there that are kind of being obsolete by Coral because I put in something about um, querying the resource directory by fetching or uh, by following also some relations. This is so much cleaner with Coral that I basically pulling back that suggestion. Um, some points are in there that can be used for replication. So if you have multiple resource directories that want to uh, give a consistent view, they need a bit more information. Uh, zone identify introspection is about the administrator wanting to look at the resource directory, even though it contains things that it can't express outside of the local link and it's not like you would be going around SSHing into devices to introspect things. If you're an administrator, you might really want to see your eyes with a percent, um, percent eth uh, Ethernet zero or something in it. Um, a skippable multicast aggregation because it's covered by the proxy proposal, multicast proxy proposal as well. And opportunistic RD is something that I'd kind of think we'll see any way in some situations where devices want to have an RD and are large enough to ship one, at least for a few registrations, um, so that clients don't need to fall back to multicast discovery. I'm pretty sure we've built something like this at ITF at some point in time. Um, so probably experience from there could be gathered in. The point is, this is a document that contains a bunch of suggestions, some of which might be interesting to the working group. And I'd like to hear whether any of this is interesting enough that people want to join in working on this, or at least express an interest that keeps me active on them to make this go forward. Next slide, please. There's a few documents that are not, a, a few um, ideas that are not in this document, but 
kind of similar because they're also describing RD extensions. I mean, RD AD and SSD is the obvious example. Coral Reef, um, I already mentioned um, RD replication. And protocol negotiation plays a bit into it, even though it needs to work without resource directory. It does have aspects of, of querying one that will be extensions to an RD. And the, when one and a half years ago, the group membership in the group concept of RD was overhauled, um, we might have lost a few use cases that could also be specified in a separate document. Uh, next slide, please. So um, of, of those things, what is the interest? What, what is something there is interest for? Um, are there particular things that you think are very important well, that, are, that should not be followed? Um, yeah, well, questions, please, ideas, anything. Uh, Hannah? I can admit it. Um, well, uh, for us, um, some of the points you had there actually I think will be taken um, or will continue in the next section actually when we talk about uh, the, the coral, for example, on the application yeah. side. But I have been seeing uh, some requirements coming from OMA. I don't know if we have the Lightweight and Doom Fox in the call at the moment. I don't see it, but some of the RD requirements were, were there. Um, a lot of the interesting stuff that I'm more interested in, at least uh, for, for resource directory, has to do with doing complex queries for the lookup interface. Um, I don't know if you, you had that in this list. Yeah, that's things like relation following, but that's probably better done with Coral Reef because yeah. the, the, the query inter basically RD extends the query interface of, of 6690 and that's that is reaching its limits within RD, so doing anything more complex is better done with code. And, and I was also, I mean, particularly in, in my case, I'm interested, not in this document, actually, it's the distributed RD that you started uh, mm -hmm. at some point. That one is still interesting for me, but I haven't had time to to work on it. And the last two items in this list, the multicast aggregation, also sounded interesting, but I haven't dedicated enough time to, to contribute. I don't know if others in the call would like to pitch in as well topics but and, and also by the way i'm thinking that maybe this could be interesting for part of one of the future uh, uh interim sessions that we will have virtual meetings that we will mm -hmm. be having uh, at the end of the month starting at the end of the month so any uh, would like to comment something feel free so thank you christian very much um, let's then uh, continue with the, what, what, what is this? With the next session, next part, oh, yeah, it's nice. so, which is, has to do with applications. Uh, I think actually right now, Klaus is where you have to start presenting. Klaus? Stop sharing. And yeah, my share. unmute button. Yep. So go ahead and start sharing. You have few minutes try to because we are way behind schedule, like plus 20 minutes behind. So if you could uh, summarize, that would be great. Yes. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. OK. Um, the first uh, item uh, is about a draft that does not exist yet. Um, but we discussed about this in Singapore and I think also in Montreal uh, already. Um, so this is um, a quick reminder of what we agreed then and the status update. And the status update can be done quickly because nothing has happened yet since then. So what did we really talk about? Um, this is um, on the one hand about um, link format where we use these link attributes like RT and CT and so on. And, and we have a hack MD somewhere where Jaime started collecting all the link attributes that are used in different documents. But we don't have any official IMR registry or anything like that for, for those link attributes. And then on the other hand, we have um, on IANA our core parameters. Um, so the uh, co-op methods and uh, resource types and uh, response codes and all of those. 
and um, I'm planning to write a new draft um, that we already have discussed uh, in, in one of the interims, um, where I want to clarify the expert review guidelines for those uh, registries that we have. And um, so what we said um, in Singapore was, um, let's use this draft also to create a new registry for the link attributes. But yeah, as I said, no, no, nothing has uh, happened on that draft yet due to lack of time. Any questions or comments on this? Well, I can comment that I, I would find it useful at least. Um, and that's why I started collecting them in a in a document. It seems to be a, so we, a recurring problem. So we, we said it's useful but not urgent, and that's why the progress is a bit slow. And this will be basically an informational draft, right? Or experimental. No informational, sorry. Um yes. So I, I would want to clarify the expert review guidelines, but maybe we also want to change some of the allocation policies. But that's the informative, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, but yeah, no, no protocol changes, just adjustments of the registries and the definition of a new registry for link attributes. So maybe I don't know if the group um, is up to date with this topic, but um, I would like to hear, especially if there is any any particularly negative uh, uh, opinions, because it might be that we have over seen some issues with this idea. So um, basically, the idea would be like to have a registry also of uh, existing link, link relations. Is it uh, right? Uh, I, I, is Jabber working? Everything, everything fine? So, I uh, think we have to discuss this at the last two ITFs and what we should do now is uh, have a document, uh, take a look at it, and then of course there will be a working group adoption call at some point. And uh, then we, we should make sure that this is the right stuff to have yeah, in, uh, in the document. Yeah, just to be clear, we are not, uh, I mean, this, is a, this should be a small document and it's more for clarifications than uh, creating uh, all right, Alexi, sounds okay. Very good. So then let's let's do that. I I, I would say that we can uh, start working on this. Uh, maybe by the next idea, have something already written. Thank you. That would be nice. Yep. Um, then on to one of our working group documents, the href draft, um, which is about our uh, constrained version of URIs. And uh, just as a very quick update on uh, what happened since the last ITF, there have been two new revisions of the draft. Um, the first one only had a one small change, and um, the larger update was uh, on the dash 03. Um, due to con time constraints in this meeting, I won't go through this list. Um, but the changes. Um, uh, Digital 3 were quite substantial, um, lots of clarifications, much more details on supported schemes, uh, creation, normalization, and comparison. Um, so there's a lot of uh, new stuff, um, good stuff in, in there. Um, but now might be useful if people um, take a look. There are a few um, open issues. Um, that might lead to some um, breaking changes um, potentially. And so um, I guess we need one more update, uh, one, one new revision before we have an implementation version. Um, but I think that um, then would be a good opportunity to uh, ask people uh, to give it a try and then implement it. And maybe we can have a small um, interrupt event in, in an interim meeting. I have two um, issues that I uh, would like to highlight if, if time permits. And um, maybe that's more interesting than going through this entire list of things that has have changed. Uh, any questions or comments on this slide?
Okay, then uh, first issue. And that was an interesting discussion uh, with uh, Jim and Christian. And I noticed uh, that um, when we write your eyes or our constrained versions of your eyes, um, we always have a bit of overhead. So if we look at this example URI, um, then we of course have these different URI components. And um, so we, we have um, some uh, data like um, coop and example.com and foo and, and so on. And then there are in between some delimiters. Um, so colons and slashes. And um, this is overhead. Um, but it's necessary overhead, because if there weren't any delimiters, then we couldn't figure out where one of those components starts and, and where the component ends. So we need to have these um, uh, um, bytes between the components that separate them in some way. But of course, if we can minimize the overhead to so express the same information, but with fewer bytes in between, that would be very useful. Um, so if we do this um, in Coral um, and we use CBOR and we have a URI, then we would have a CBOR um, a text string that's major type 23. And uh, this URI has 49 bytes because we have this very long uh, path segment at the end. And so we use additional information 24 and this one extra byte 49 to, to have the length. And in total, uh, we would have uh, 44 bytes for, for the components and seven bytes for these delimiters uh, and the initial COEM CBOR prefix, um, which are seven bytes, so seven bytes um, of overhead. And the question is, can we minimize this overhead? And if we now look at how it's currently done in the href draft. Um, we also have these components um, and each component or, or subcomponent um, is, is similar to co-op where we have options. So there's an option number and an option value length and then that's followed by the, the value itself. And um, in CBOR, we would encode the option number as an unsigned integer. So that's major type zero and additional information zero for, for option zero. And uh, for the um, scheme here, it's a text string, so major type three and length is four. Um, and the whole thing uh, we are wrapping in a CBOR array. Um, there are eight elements. Um, for components, and in each component has uh, one unsigned integer for the option number, and, and then the value itself with the initial byte. Um, so uh, again, we have 44 bytes of um, data, uh, but 10 bytes of overhead. So um, in, in this point, um, uh, the CBOR encoding actually does not help to make this uh, very concise. So I was thinking, can we maybe improve on this somehow? And one thing we could do is um, we could throw away the overhead that is generated by CBOR. That's these uh, type indications for the unsigned integer and the text strings. Because um, if we know the option number, we also know the type. So we could combine the option number and the option value length into a single byte, three bits for the number and five bits for the length. And so we only have uh, four bytes uh, for the four components. And then we wrap the whole thing in a CBOR byte array. Um, so we have in the end uh, 34 bytes of data and six bytes of overhead. What do you think? It's all Jim's fault. He said uh, that uh, we are now looking to save every single byte we can.
So I'm not sure the queuing system. Ah, it actually does work. Um, so um, yeah, we we have this this RFC called seven two five two, which gives us a really nice encoding of of multiple options. So maybe we could use that. Um, I'm I'm wondering if if that actually is worth adding more decoding and encoding stuff to, to what's already in, in CBOR. Um, so I think that, that that has to be carefully uh, balanced. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, th th that format we came up with for, for co-op is pretty good. So um, you you wouldn't have uh, major concerns about not using CBOR inside there. Well, again, it, it's more work, and we should decide whether it's worth it. Mm -hmm. um, so in in this particular case, we, we are saving some slightly less than than ten percent. Uh, if we think that that's generally worth it. Uh, then we should go for it. We probably shouldn't invent. Uh, I mean, everybody of us can come up with something that's even more efficient with lots of bit twiddling and and stuff. Probably shouldn't invent a, a third form. So for me, what the the decision would be between uh, sticking with uh, this as as a data structure that is expressed in in Siebel, um or carrying around a, a coab like data structure, but then we would really follow the core example. So we would actually use data uh, encoding for the option number and so on. So it would be exactly like co except that the, the number space, of course, is different uh, from from the one we use for co itself. Would it really? I didn't hear that. Should it really, Christian? Be yes. different. Still not sure I, I understood you. I was just wondering whether it really needs to be different or whether I could just really literally copy those around into a co into a co-op header. Parts of it at least. But that's a detailed problem for now. Um, fun fact, um, before Coral was using Seabor, it was actually using the co-op message format. Uh, of course, not the same options. Um, but um, the, the whole Corel document was basically a, a co-op message formatted uh, representation. Um, but yeah, let's, let's move on because we don't have a lot of time. Let's, let's have the last person in the queue. I think Jim was on the WebEx uh, mentioning something. Okay. Jim Wright. Thank you very much. Um, I understand you're right, uh, Klaus. You're talking about using five bits to, to indicate a string length. That apply to the domain name component of a URL because the maximum length of a domain name will be considerably more than 32 bits, than 32, 32 bytes. Um, yes, yeah, so if we use five bits for the value length, then we're limited to uh, up to 31 bytes. Um, that's not a lot, I agree. On the other hand, um, we are uh, assuming very constrained devices with very limited memory. So those devices probably won't be storing uh, URLs with, with uh, hundreds of bytes anyway. And so this might actually be in the ballpark of lengths that will be used in practice. But then again, uh, we noticed a couple of times already in other protocols that putting in hard limits uh, that are low like this um, eventually hurts us. So um, it's a difficult uh, thing here to estimate what would be the right thing. I noticed in my implementation that I get a lot of benefits if the separators or these prefixes before the components have a fixed size. So if we use the co-op message format and, and the delta encoding and all of that, um, we would, uh, like in CBOR, have a variable length encoding of, of the number of bytes. 
And that would actually hurt my implementation a lot. So more, more to think about here. Okay, thank you, Klaus. Um, maybe then uh, we can continue on the next uh, presentation. Um, I think I can just start presenting, right? Uh, just a second, sorry. I had uh, COVID itself no, um, no on the agenda. Um, no, 10 minutes slot for, for all of this, basically. Okay. Um, I, I wonder if we can, uh, because basically we have to accommodate for the discussion and it might be that we move some of the last uh, drafts to uh, another session and one of the interims, because we basically have 20 minutes left, 22 minutes. So Jim, if you can just go ahead with this uh, discussion, please. Uh, Jim, can I hear you? Uh, Jim? I have noise now. Yes, now you have. Okay, I just reconnected. Uh, one of the things that I've been trying to do is figure out exactly what the app structure looks like because I keep wanting to uh, actually write a document for an app and it's just been kind of hard because nobody really knows so it's really hard for me to see uh, it's my sorry my mistake i don't know what's going on with the <laughs> presentation today so, it's... So, so basically what i want to try to do is is get some more discussion started with a larger group of people um there's been a couple of us who have talked about this at various different times we have no slides. You have the wrong, wrong have, screen. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Just a second. I'm just going to try to share the screen because there was a problem with the slides. If I just, uh, you should be able to see this now. Yes. All right. Yes. Uh, next slide. So basically what I'm, what I'm trying, to, trying to do in this presentation is basically talk about some things that, that we need input from and some different possible ways to, to go. Um, the last item is, is something that Klaus keeps wanting to do, which is he'd like to be able to have these descriptions be machine readable. Um, I'm more interested in making sure that they're actually usable and readable. Um, so that it's, okay, uh, next slide. So the, the two basic um, methods that we want to, to, to look at as, and the ones that we have, have been approached is to basically write the app documents um, based upon links, which is what HTML documents are doing today. Um, and the second is to basically go ahead and, and write it based on objects, you know, the object oriented programming world. I have a much better understanding um, personally of how to do the second than the first. So I'm not really too sure exactly what the first one would look like in a document, and I but I do know what the second one would look like. In both cases, we really want to define some common definition stuff um, so that we can do things, we, we can write things once and not have to write them over and over in every document. Uh, next slide. So the, 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 by link basically is, is the standard thing which you're doing today. So you basically say, here's a link and the relation type is, is this is a collection. And by the fact that you know it's a collection or you know it has a specific interface defined, you know exactly how to interact with that because so, and you can potentially put in multiple relations. So you could say, this is a, this is a collection which says, this is how you would do get, this is how you do the fetch. You could say that this is also deletable, um, which says that you know how that you know you can delete that item, um, 
is so it basically go through and, and list things that way. Uh, next. Uh, the second is is basically similar, but it, it you're basically defining it on objects. So you're going to say, you know, this is a collection of items, and and by and the item is basically a, a parameter that you can change. So that basically says you're going to support a get and fetch. You can have an item that supports get and fetch. You can have a deletable item which is inherits from an item, but it adds the definition of, of delete. Um, next. So the three applications that we have right now that we need, that we really need to write up and, and get going is the pub sub document, which has basically looked at trying to rewrite it into into Coral, and they've got a new model, and but they just haven't managed to get it written up. Um, Reef, there's at least a couple of different versions of Reef running around there. But they are, they all are basically the same thing. This is is an application of how to talk to a resource directory. Uh, there's also over in the ACE working group, the uh, gr um, group Keen administration document, which basically is exactly the same thing. And when you look at these, they have a lot of commonalities. I mean, there's all of them have containers of objects. All of them have to have objects. So if we could write this common stuff down and get it written out in a way that's useful, and we don't have to repeat all the time, we're probably better off. Uh, next. Okay. Okay. Have. okay. So, do people have comments? Do people have preferred ways of dealing with things um, in terms of what documents should look like? Um, I know that we were all. If, if you read, the, if you've gone back and actually read the resource directory, um, Christian has basically rewritten the, the the text on all of the. This is all of the interactions a couple of times to, to, to deal with. You know how many how many errors do we need to do? How many errors do we not need to document and so forth? Um, open for discussion. On, I, I have the Etherpad, or I don't know if there's a right. queue, but um, I just want one, one question. Is it is it really simply just a collection pattern versus object pattern, as you outlined in the earlier slides? Or um, can you explain, is there a little more to it, or is that really the main um, dilemma here? Those were the two patterns that Klaus and I and a couple of people came up with. There may be other patterns, um, and I'd be more than happy to, if, if you want to describe other patterns, I'd be more than happy to listen to them. No, I think that makes sense. I mean, I guess it's, a, they're all collections of links, but what do you want, how do you want to deal with the overall um, higher level resource that that is represented by the collection itself? I, I think that's really what I was getting at and, and whether that's really the core of the question. I can. I don't know if Jim, do you want to reply or if you want to? No, I don't have a reply. Yeah. I don't have. Okay, a okay. Reply. So, uh, I I can say as far as PubSub is concerned that I feel that it would be nice to have some sort of um, high level guidelines of how to do these applications, especially if we move into the coral territory right now. That's that's my uh, high level thought. Maybe we move from the queue now. Thomas, you are there. Oops, wrong screen. Thomas, go ahead. So an ignorant question. So, could you please elaborate a bit on the difference and similarities, maybe with uh, Open API and Swagger, that you see? Um, no, because I don't know them well enough. Okay, thank. The uh, short answer here is that in Open API, you specify which URLs are available and what operations on which URLs are possible. And if we use hypermedia, then we discover all the URLs from the server's responses. But basically, we, we 
would like to have something like open api except we wouldn't have all the urls in in the in, in the file okay thanks i see so this is the api temp question thanks for clarifying that Uh, we have more time for this uh, discussion, if anybody wants to comment. All right, so I guess maybe the discussion um, was cut a bit. I, mean, I, I don't know, Jim, you want to you wanna say some remarks basically before concluding? Because I don't know if the people are too familiar with the, I mean, the, the group as a whole is familiar with the topic, to be honest. Yeah, I, well, I mean, is, is 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 something we need to have talked about um the one other thing that that potentially needs to be added to this is you still have potentially the reef content type schema to talk about um in addition to to the the this list um i think i'll go ahead and try to write up something and mail it to the list and see if we get any more comments and discussion yep. Yeah, I think some idea of a proposal, and I, I think you know, going along these lines, there there are different ways of doing this. But I, I guess I agree. We just need to come up with a common one. Um, so maybe some proposals or some ideas of what one could look like. Uh, maybe like so, my, um, Jim, uh, you can also maybe wait after one of the interims that we will have on applications, anyways, and after that, maybe we have some more clarity on this topic. Yeah, that makes sense too. And then uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes left. Uh, so if we could maybe have problem details in five minutes and then versions in another, cinemal versions in another five, that would be great. Sorry for the hassle. Otherwise, we can have it on a different interim. So okay. just go ahead, Thomas. Oh, that's right. So next, please. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. So this is one proposal for another reporting format for web APIs. So it is very much based on a similar work that has been done in HTTP land with RFC uh, 7807. That was published last November in Singapore um, uh, and, and it's gone through two iterations since. Um, um, it's been presented in a core upside meeting in Singapore. Uh, where the sense of the room, if I, if I haven't misinterpreted it, was that this might be useful work and worth pursuing. Uh, so we got good discussion, both offline with Karsten Klaus and obviously, obviously Jaime, um, who's co-authoring this, um, as well as on the mailing list with a nice review from Jim and, and further comments from, from Christian. So this is just to say that this is it's not been around for ages, but it's not completely new either. So maybe this is actually a good time to discuss what we want to do with that, with a wider group. So the scope of this, hopefully very short presentation is first, recap a bit what, what the proposal is. Obviously, I'd recommend you go and read the draft as well. Um, and second, to present some pending issues and questions. And third, to propose one specific way forward that we have discussed between the co-authors, which we informally call the co-organization, and you get the hint of that. And finally, discuss the draft, let's say, fate. Okay, so next, please. Okay, so the problem has this simple format with a global area and a local area. Uh, the global area contains code points of two sorts, those that allow precise error identifications, namespace and type, and the second category that comprises um, common fields that are likely to be shared across um, many errors, all errors, let's say. Uh, the variable path for, for those with an inclination towards ASN1 can be seen as an any defined by namespace. By namespace. So, the keys defined here have a scope meaning. So then spacing is used as one would expect as the um, semantic anchor, right? So, um, and these NS code points, namespace code points can be either private if they're negatives or public if they're positive. And so the idea is that when and if an API goes public, renumbering happens by grabbing a public um, NS code point from the registry and maybe providing a spec document uh, with that, but it is not, it is not uh, mandatory. And the rest, by that I mean uh, all the types and any extension that goes with it stay the same. So basically renumbering 
the, the renumbering operation uh, consists of re rerouting the semantic tree. Um, okay. Next, please. Okay, so let's see some 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 open problems. So, of an issue with localization, it has been highlighted by Jim. Um, so, is there anything we do to help here? Uh, should we recommend the default language? Um, as we stand, it looks like something can be done at least at the title level by mapping an SN type to a localized title string. Uh, but, but then the variable parts like details and any extensions are much more tricky to handle in, in, in more general case. Right? So, as a note in Corel, um, uh, localization of text strings uh, can be done by nesting links of types uh, uh, language, if I remember correctly. Next, please. Backslash. Okay, so for reference here, you can look at Appendix B of RFC 6648. Uh, if you're interested, there's a good analysis on the problem there. Uh, but again, I'm, in a nutshell, the idea is that when moving from private to public, uh, if the producer doesn't update, uh, and therefore the private namespace sticks in the environmental consumers, um, and by, by which I mean not just the core clients, but the whole logging pipeline, or at least significant chunks of it. Uh, they need to cope with that for an unbounded amount of time. Right? So the trouble here is that consumers don't seem to have much power in this struggle. So what could we say here? I don't know. I guess we should at least provide some guidance in, or, or discussion on strategies for, for minimizing the risk of this eternal pollution, right? For example, I recommend suit or whatever automated software update mechanism you, you prefer would be one thing. But maybe there's more to do, right? Next, please. There was an, so, so there was a question from Jim. Jim suggested uh, subsuming the, the diagnostic payload under the problem structure. Uh, so not for all um, diagnostic payload users, but at least for the extended tracing pattern, which seems to be very useful in both from an API developer point of view as well as the uh, to diagnose a pathological situations in the field. Uh, so we need to do that. We could do that very simply by adding a new optional diagnostic key in the global map, um, which we don't have at the moment. During the discussion, the mailing list, Christian seemed a bit doubtful about that. His comment was uh, uh, the APIs that need something similar could add their own extension, and that is very true. In fact, grabbing a new code point in the local map is very cheap, is a very cheap operation. So I think the question is, uh, is this usage pattern going to be common and, and useful enough that it is, it is worth uh, uh, factoring it out proactively or not? So is there an appetite for that? Next, please. Transition. Yes. So the idea Jaime, Klaus, and myself have been discussing, discussing is about moving this fully to Quora. Um, if you do a pro cons analysis, uh, we have um, on the good side the fact that doing this would be technically superior in that um, it completely absorbs encoding compression and transfer of other bits, right? And then there's a the dual aspect as well that from the core point of view, problem provides a uh, full integrated and reusable building block that the core toolbox could use. Um, on, on the con side, uh, there, there's the dependency on core machinery. I mean, and, and, things to understand is how strong is the dependency. So can we make, for example, a minimalist implementation that is comparable in complexity with the current spec or not? Um, and, and the other thing is the, the timing dependency. So how long will it take to get it out? Uh, which is really a question about coral stability at this point in time, um, in a sense that uh, how can we expect, so when can we expect core moving? Um, the moving parts of Coral uh, to, to be stable enough, to become stable enough so that we can put this on top of that without problem. Uh, next, please. So I think, yeah, the, 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 there are three big questions I see here. Uh, first and foremost is whether standardization of a problem format is actually needed or not. Is, yeah. Question. And subordinate, subordinate to that uh, is, is the question about is this the document in this um, uh, shape ready for adoption or not? And and third, uh, as, as the bargain invites us to ponder, 
uh, is, is whether to quarrel or not to quarrel. I have a, you know, I know how to answer the, the last one, uh, but uh, I'd like to hear from from the rest of the group. Cheers. And thank you, Thomas. Before going, sorry for thank you for the presentation. Very good. Uh, um, before going into the queue, I would like to quickly ask uh, who has read the draft on the. You can answer on the Webex or on the Jabber. Um, just to be aware of how many. I mean, my gut feeling is about five, six people, maybe. Okay. And then uh, I'll continue on the Jabber. And then if you could also mention in the Jabber now uh, who will be in favor of adopting this draft in core um, without whether to coral or not to coral, <laughs> we may go for link format. Uh, one, I, I mean, I would prefer coral, obviously. You know, it's up to the group. Um, and I see only uh, plus, well, uh, apart from the authors, I suppose. Uh, uh, I see three, four. Well, we, six maybe for uh, Jabber. I cannot see the Webex, so we will count it later. Either way, we, this will go to the list, but uh, at least now I get an impression of who is interested in this. And now we can go to the queue. And I think it was Michael on it. Um, I'm all for adopting. I would use it elsewhere. Um, I'll just comment that maybe we want to wordsmith the title or the draft name. Every time I read core co-app problem. I think that there's a problem with co-app. Wow. And I have to remember this is about something else. So that that just maybe would be a good yeah, maybe something with description or or yeah. I get I get what you mean. Yep. Any other comments in the queue? Because we are I mean my clock says 29, so I, I guess we will not have CNML. Um so we might as well just uh, dig deeper on this one. Um Hi, there is a time aspect on the CNML thing. So, so yes. moving this forward again, it's not going to work. So I, I, just, I, I just need one bit here. Can we start working group adoption call for the thing on the mailing list now? Uh, you're talking about versions? Yes. Yeah, I can ask the group again the same question. Who has read the CNML versions? Just plus plus one on red on the chat, either Jabber or uh, Ari. You cannot vote twice. I, I can say myself. I have read, and I think it's useful. Also on Webex, please. Okay, and and I assume uh, I mean so and those who have read it who will be in favor of adoption. Okay. okay, so we have two, four, five. Okay, would be, I mean, any one of those who have read it would be against adoption. So, I mean, the, this document is actually rather uh, simple. It's a shame we didn't have the time for the presentation. We can send it to the list, but uh, I mean, this is something we need. We have been discussing it before with the Senate more units. We have had a lengthy discussion with the AD, and it, this was a comment that basically was voiced out. And the document itself is rather simple. So I think we should adopt it, but uh, uh, maybe we, we want to keep, you know, uh, some discussion or a lot of the some discussion open at least for how we do the versioning which uh, uh, at the moment is uh, novel to me the way we do it i haven't seen it before and it has a limitation i don't know if it's the hard limit for the versions were not 49 or 50 so basically it's a, a different way than we have done versioning elsewhere but um so basically we have in total i'm trying to read from the ether which number we have by the way if somebody could write it down the total number for adoption Six supporting adoption in total. Yeah. Okay, that sounds enough. Uh, so let's let's uh, call for adoption on this one. We will send it to the mailing list, and then people will be able to discuss it there as well.
Thank you. Um, sorry, sorry again for the lack of time. We didn't uh, maybe think this uh, through. We were too ambitious on the timing. Sorry for that. We'll, we'll have a lot of interviews to discuss. Everybody can read my slides, which are uh, out there. And uh, uh, I think we should have a technical discussion uh, in the next interim meeting, which is when? Uh, end of April, right? I don't know, actually. I don't remember by heart. April 29. Yes. yes. Exactly. Great. Okay. Uh, any other issues? Any other comments? We have a flex time of minus two. Then uh, thank you very much, guys, for your time, and and hope to see you again in the interims. Cool. Cheers, bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. bye.